What's up, guys? Michael here with yet another Rick and Morty Season 5 Quick Take. The latest episode, A Rick Convenient Mort, finds Morty getting into a passionate, probably illegal relationship with Planet Tina. Hey, there's a little boy on her. Oh, no, drop the curtain. An environmental super person slash corporatized advocate for recycling. Over the course of the episode, Planet Tina's devotion to Mother Earth quickly turns her into an arsonist and murderer. And Morty can't stomach the whole killing 300 people side of his new booze personality. But does Planet Tina kind of have a point? Now, before you freak out, let us explain in this wisecrack quick take on Rick and Morty, was Planet Tina right? And before we continue, spoilers ahead. But before we get into it, I wanted to tell you guys about something else we do here at Wisecrack, podcasts. They're like audio versions of YouTube videos, except much longer with multiple very awesome hosts and on a variety of topics that we don't have time to cover in our videos. If you want to hear us dive deeper into our favorite movies from classics to recent releases and everything else in between, check out Show Me The Meaning, where hosts Austin, Ryan, and Raymond, plus the occasional special guest, uncover all of the deeper meaning hidden beneath the surface of their cinematic favorites. For a breakdown of everything going on in the cultural zeitgeist, we have Culture Binge, hosted by Serby and myself, where we use current events as an occasion to analyze what's going on in our culture. Also, we occasionally give weird personal advice on things like dating and dealing with your family. Finally, if you are a fan of Rick and Morty, we have The Squanch, where Ryan Haley and I explore all of the madness and meaning in each new episode of Season 5 alongside a special guest. We do everything from analyze episode structure to uncover the secret theological and philosophical themes hidden behind the clones, decoys, and ocean lords. So check them out wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe to our Wisecast channel on YouTube to watch video versions of all of our podcasts. And now, back to the show. From the start, the episode is skeptical of how effective Planetina really is. At the outset, she's a rhyme-happy recycling enthusiast who can also stop acid rain. Your acid rain is an acid pain in the butt. But we quickly learn that she's functionally an environmentalist celebrity working at the behest of this money-hungry crew. Hey, buddy, you want an autograph? That's 20 bucks a pop. Planetina's early environmental efforts are mostly defined by fun slogans. There's only one solution for Earth's pollution. You! She's an obvious satire of Captain Planet and the environmental messaging of the time. While the 70s and 80s saw plenty of government regulation to stop environmental degradation, despite Reagan's best efforts, political will to expand these efforts began to fade in the late 80s and early 90s. As federal leadership waned, corporations increasingly undertook voluntary, arguably rather cynical steps to limit their environmental damage. This so-called corporate environmentalism was actually pretty toothless, yielding initiatives that sounded good but didn't do much in what one activist dubbed greenwashing. But it was enough to stave off government regulation, deliver good publicity, and pass much of the responsibility for fixing the environment on to consumers. For example, when the plastics industry poured money into a marketing effort to popularize recycling, supposedly fixing the whole landfill problem. Without the government taking charge, saving the planet became about personal responsibility, despite the fact that 70% of the world's pollution is caused by just 100 companies. And personal responsibility is Planetina's whole vibe, encouraging you to recycle batteries. Everyone should discard used batteries at proper disposal centers instead of tossing them into a regular waste bin. Or save a bunny from a forest fire. He traveled 200 miles just to save a rabbit from the fire. She's probably not really making significant change. Her solutions to pollution, like recycling, make people feel good but don't functionally stop our planet from dying. A fact she doesn't initially seem to realize. You're not an idiot. You recycled. But when her activism proves ineffective at stopping some work-happy miners, she hits a breaking point. So what's a fed-up environmental superhero to do? That's when Planetina goes rogue, setting fire to a mine full of workers and burning down a congressman's house. Is her violent rage justifiable? The murder part, definitely not. But burning down a mine? That's a little more complicated at least according to Swedish academic and activist Andreas Malm. He argues that change of the magnitude needed to keep Earth inhabitable can only be achieved if the environmental movement changes dramatically. Specifically, he wants activists to employ strategic acts of violence against the private property of polluting corporations, as he explains in his book, fittingly titled, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Now, to be crystal clear, Mom would not have endorsed Planetina's actions. He doesn't believe in causing physical harm to people or sentient amalgams of natural elements, but rather to infrastructure that is hurting the environment. He argues that major positive societal change 
has pretty much only ever happened via violence. From the Haitian Revolution to the Suffragan Movement, the latter of which involved a lot more breaking of windows and lighting buildings on fire than you might remember from history class. Importantly, he notes that, at least in the Suffragan Movement, not a single life was lost. Only empty buildings were set ablaze. The suffragists took great pains to avoid injuring people. While America loves to wax poetic about nonviolent protest, he says this is a whitewashed historical mythos. While every social movement has plenty of peaceful protesters, they also have members willing to commit radical acts of strategic violence. In contrast, the mainstream climate movement has, especially in recent years, been mostly corporate friendly and well-mannered much like Planetina early on. There's only one solution for Earth's pollution. Meanwhile, destructive oil pipelines continue to be built and carbon emissions continue to rise. And honestly, I'm sweating balls year round. He calls this alleged lack of urgency in the environmental movement, Lanchester's paradox. The paradox is this, the coming climate crisis is so urgent and dire with the capacity to literally wipe out human existence, yet protests have been relatively mild-mannered. He asks, at what point do we escalate? When do we start physically attacking the things that consume our planet and destroy them with our own hands? We see Planetina experiencing Lanchester's paradox when she tries to politely convince the miners not to tear up the land to no avail. Malm argues that this will always be the case and that the movement needs to take a different approach, writing, so here is what the movement of millions should do for a start. Announce and enforce the prohibition of carbon emissions. Damage and destroy new CO2 emitting devices. Put them out of commission pick them apart, demolish them, burn them, blow them up. Let the capitalists who keep on investing in the fire know that their properties will be trashed. He argues that if people do this en masse, eventually it'll stop being cost effective for corporations to invest in dirty energy. Emissions will go down, planets saved, no more oceans on fire, probably. In line with Malm, though again, via murdering people, which he explicitly says not to do, Planetina gets violent destroying the mind and its infrastructure so that it can't pollute anymore. Here, she goes from focusing on individual responsibility for pollution to radically attacking the capitalist system that has destroyed the planet. But Morty, for his part, is horrified, rejecting her activism and saying, If that's the only way, I, I don't want to be saved. And most people would probably agree, obviously when it comes to murder, but probably also to the destruction of private property in the name of environmentalism. Malm, for his part, counters that our concept of private property will cost us the earth. He gives examples of successful violent interventions that involve property damage such as the 30 attacks on a gas pipeline that permanently shut down the pipeline during the Egyptian Revolution. Similar tactics have found success in Ecuador, Sweden, and India, to name just a few of Malm's examples. Of course, most of us aren't about to go blow up a pipeline. Did you hear that, FBI? And the problem of a coming climate crisis can understandably feel too huge and too terrifying to even contemplate. So what are most of us effectively doing? Interestingly enough, that question brings us to Summer and Rick's B-plot, in which they party hop from orgiastic dying planet to orgiastic dying planet. This subplot shows a very real way some people react to the climate crisis, with a sort of nihilism. This gay sex with my dad is terrific! What was I thinking? It'll all be over soon! Hey, the Earth is to shit anyhow, so why don't we snort coke through a plastic straw in my SUV while blasting the AC kind of thing? Yeah, which on second thoughts, that sounds like a very, that sounds like a very dumb idea. Don't do that. This could be a commentary on the first world's response to the coming climate disaster, which has been largely not to do much of anything while we keep polluting like our lives depend on it. As Summer and Rick see, it's easier and more fun to just go with the flow, eat some alien ass, and enjoy the ride while it lasts. Oh, is that another ass? Don't mind if I blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Especially when change feels so difficult and so out of reach. Such an approach would understandably probably make Mom weep. Hey, she's the one that saved the world. Now we gotta go to work tomorrow. <laughs> At the same time, most people aren't looking to blow up a pipeline on their day off. But what do you guys think? Is violence the only way to stop our planet from literally catching on fire? Or is there a healthy medium ground between Summer and Planetina? Let us know what you think in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Be sure to check out our Rick and Morty podcast, The Squanch, and blow up that subscribe button like you're saving a planet to spite your grandpa. And don't forget to ring that bell. As always, thanks for watching. Later.